pause the short question break. Let us uh, progress on uh, with more topics from this chapter. The next topic is transactions and there is a lot on transactions coming up later in this course, but at this point I am not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just briefly mention what is a transaction. A uh, transaction is basically a unit of work. I, if you recall, I told you on the first day that if you go to a bank and withdraw cash, for you that is a transaction. If you go to a bank and make a payment for your mobile bill from your ATM, what is it doing? It is deducting from your bank account and crediting it to your uh, mobile bill. So, that is a transaction which involves two updates. Now, what you need for this is both the updates should succeed. It should withdraw from your account, it should credit to your uh, mobile uh, bill account. Now, a transaction which spans two entities, your bank and your uh, mobile uh, phone uh, service provider is uh, more complicated. So, let us stick to simpler transactions for now, which happen within a single database. So, if I want to transfer money from my account to your account, uh, then I need to tell the bank, please deduct 50 rupees from my account and credit 50 rupees to this person's account. Both these steps should happen. If not, both should fail. If one happens, if the bank deducts 50 rupees from my account and does not credit it to the other account, uh, then I will be unhappy. The bank has eaten up my money. On the other hand, if the bank credits your account for 50 rupees and does not debit my account, then the bank is going to be unhappy because it just lost 50 rupees. So, what we want is the two updates should appear to be atomic. Now, in reality, it is not possible in any computer system to do two updates exactly at the same time. Therefore, it is a job of the recovery system of the database to ensure that if anything goes wrong in the middle of a sequence of updates which form a transaction, then all the steps up to that point are rolled back, they are undone. So, that is the job of a database system. So, an atomic transaction is a sequence of steps which are either fully executed or rolled back as if none of the steps occurred. So, you compensate if, if I deducted 50 rupees from my account and you could not credit it to the other account for whatever reason, you will credit 50 rupees back to my account and settle that. So, that is one aspect of a transaction. Another aspect is to prevent concurrent transactions from stepping on each other's toes. So, if two people are concurrently trying to update my balance, there could be trouble. We will see this in more detail later. Um, the uh, programmer who is using SQL should not have to worry about concurrency, but the programmer needs to tell the database what is a transaction, what set of steps together constitutes a transaction. So, in the SQL definition standard, by default a transaction begins and all the steps which you execute consecutively are part of the same transaction until you either say commit work or roll back work or just say commit or roll back. The keyword work can be dropped. This is standard. Nobody implements the standard. What do real databases do? They treat each SQL statement which you submit as a transaction on its own. So, if your SQL statement updates 100 rows, it will run atomically. Either all 100 rows will be updated or if something goes wrong in the middle, it will roll back and no row would have been updated at the end. So, all database systems will treat a single SQL statement as a transaction. The question is how do you force the database to treat a set of SQL statements as a transaction. Now, here uh, the syntax again SQL has a standard uh, which I told you. In fact, there is another standard which says uh, in, in SQL which says if you say begin atomic and then have a set of statements and then say commit or roll back, all of those should be one transaction. Again, this is not supported directly in most database systems. Um, so, for example, in uh, PostgreSQL, you will be doing this later on. You can say begin and then have a set of things which are all part of the same transaction. It is just like the syntax here, begin atomic and there is no end. You say begin, drop atomic, execute statements and then say commit or roll back in PostgreSQL. 
and all of those statements in between will be treated as a single transaction. Um, another way of doing it, if you are submitting the queries from an API such as JDBC, JDBC uh, designers realize that each database has its own syntax. Therefore, they provide an API call which basically says um, on this connection, turn off auto commit. What does that mean? Uh, it says, uh, do not immediately commit each SQL statement by itself on this connection from now on. Then the connection will receive a series of SQL statements and then you say connection dot commit or connection dot rollback. We will see this later today. So, the point is that using the API, you can define what is a transaction. So, whichever way you do it, transactions are an important thing for any programmer who is building an application. Many times, people forget to create transactions and can leave their application in an inconsistent state. Like an employee uh, record, when an employee joins, maybe you should have put it in two places. But because of a failure, it goes in one place and does not go in the other. This is a little dangerous because you normally will not notice this happening. 99.9% .9 of the time, everything will go fine. And then in that one case, when there is a power failure at some critical point, things go haywire. And then a very important central database system has an inconsistency and all kinds of problems can arise. So, you have to be careful about transactions. Okay. So, coming back, um, we uh, have a little bit of time before the break and what I want to do is uh, quickly cover integrity constraints. Uh, we have already discussed uh, some of these. We have seen the not null constraint, we have seen the primary key constraint. There is also a unique constraint which declares something to be a super key in effect. And then there is a check constraint. So, let us just go over those. Not null, we have already seen. I will not repeat it. Unique, you can just say unique and list the one or more attributes, which declares that those attributes form a super key. That is, no two tuples should be exactly the same on those attributes. Now, there is a uh, Actually, we say it forms a candidate key, uh, but SQL does not actually have a way of checking if it is minimal. So, it is probably better to call it super key. Um, now, note that when you say unique, the system allows you to put null values for those attributes. In contrast, if you say primary key, null values are not allowed. So, it is possible for two tuples to be to have all the attributes A1 through AM, all of them being null that is not a problem. The system will allow both of those tuples to exist. It's a, uh, unique is occasionally useful uh, when you want two things which are unique. So, I want uh, ID to be unique for an employee. I also want an email ID to be unique for an employee. So, I may declare ID to be the primary key and I may declare email to be unique to make sure that there is no mistake where two employees get the same email ID. Now, the moving on to the check clause, check can be thrown in as part of an integrity constraint. Let us look at the bottom of this table, create table section. There are a number of attributes. I am going to skip all of those and go to the very bottom and it says check semester in fall, winter, spring, summer. What does this check clause do? Whenever a tuple is inserted or updated, it will check if the value for the semester attribute is in one of these listed values. If it is not, the check fails. What happens if the check fails? The transaction is rolled back. That update fails. So, uh, you can see that this is important. Otherwise, people can store any old garbage in the semester field. So, maybe somebody will say fall, somebody will say autumn, somebody else will have a typing error and say FAL and so forth. Then your data is really messed up. So, uh, check constraints can be quite useful. Um, in this particular case, the semester in fall, uh, winter, spring, summer, some of you will no doubt say, why do you need a check constraint here? Why not create a semester table, a mas this is often called a master table, a semester master table, which lists what are all the possible semesters. So, the semester is a primary key in that semester master table. If you had such a semester master table, what can you do here? You can just declare semester is a 
foreign key referencing that table. So, immediately uh, you know whatever values are there only can be here. In fact, that is probably a better solution for this case, because tomorrow if I want to add a new semester, I can add it. This happened in IIT Bombay. Uh, initially, there was no winter semester. We had uh, only um, uh, autumn, spring and summer. Then we had to add a new semester. And uh, later, we had to model certain projects which span a summer and an autumn. So, they actually created a semester corresponding to this longer term, because each course was supposed to match to a semester. So, if by creating a master table, uh, we get this flexibility of adding new ones without going and changing the schema. On the other hand, if I want to uh, make sure that the credits for a course are not garbage. So, I know from my domain knowledge that credits cannot be 0 or less than 0. That does not make sense. Uh, 0 may make sense. Occasionally, you have a non-credit course. Less than 0 certainly does not make sense. I also know that credits are supposed to reflect how many hours you spend on something in a week. Um, now, what is the maximum number of credits possible? Uh, I assume 144 is the number of hours in a week and um, it is 24, not 144, I am sorry, 24 into 7, um, 168. So, that is the uh, number of hours per week. So, credits cannot go more than this. Deducting time for sleeping and so on, obviously, is going to be much smaller. So, you could put a constraint that credits cannot go beyond say 50 or 60. So, that is a limit. So, the check clause can check that credits are greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to let us say 70. So, that is a pretty useful check clause, where I cannot have a foreign key with a master table. So, in fact, if you look at our uh, university schema, there are quite a few occurrences of check clauses to do some such validity checks, including this one, which we have shown here. Okay. Referential integrity is just another name for foreign keys. We have already seen foreign keys. Um, what I am going to do is show you a couple of extra options that SQL allows with foreign keys. The first one here is what we have seen before. Course has a attribute called department name, which references department. So, that is fine. Now, this one is a modification of the previous one, which in addition to saying department name references department, it says on delete cascade, on update cascade. What does that mean? Cascading uh, updates means that supposing I delete a particular department and I have declared course to be a foreign key on delete cascade. Then if I delete the department, all courses in that department will also get deleted. If I did not specify on delete cascade, what would happen? The department deletion would simply be blocked. It will say sorry, I cannot delete this department, because there is still a course referencing it. Now, it probably does not make sense to go around deleting departments, um, but in this domain we had to create an example like that. But let us take a different one. I have a purchase order, a, a bill let us say which has to be created. A bill has many lines in there, what are the things you bought. If you store it in a normalized schema, you have a bill master and then you have a items in the bill, another relation. So, there are two relations with a foreign key reference. Now, maybe I decided to cancel a bill and delete the whole thing. So, if I delete a bill, I should also delete all the items that reference the bill, which are all the lines in that particular bill. So, there an on delete cascade would make a lot of sense. Similarly, on update cascade, why is that useful? Maybe a department decides to change its name. We have had that happening in IIT metallurgy department at some point decided uh, that people there are not just doing uh, stuff with metals, but they are also dealing with non-metals. And in general, they uh, became a metallurgical engineering and material science, the name changed. Now, uh, it is probably a bad idea to have a name as a primary key, because the name is long. In our university schema, we used it to keep the schema simple. We did not want to add more and more attributes. In reality, you would probably have a department code or a department ID, which is what would be referenced. 
so, you probably will not go around updating it, but if there was a need to do it for whatever reason, uh, then if you specify on update cascade, you go update the ID of a department from 5 to 11, then every tuple which references it will also be updated from 5 to 11. So, that is what on update cascade does. There are alternatives, for example, you can say on delete set null or on delete default, uh, set to default. Similarly, on update set null or set to default. So, those are cascading actions and they can be useful. I believe our uh, schema has a few other examples of cascading actions. You can go see the DDL in the lab today. So, now in while a transaction runs, an integrity constraint may be violated. Now, ideally, uh, if a transaction runs, we know that while a transaction is running, for example, if transaction which is debiting one account and crediting another, is definitely going to leave that have an inconsistent state in the middle. When it has debited 50 rupees from your account and has not yet updated the other account, the sum of the account balances has actually changed, which should not happen. So, in the middle of a transaction, certain conceptual integrity constraints are violated. But what about foreign key constraints? Should you allow those to be violated in the middle of a transaction? And the answer for all database systems by default is they will not allow these to be updated at any point. The moment you do an insert, it is checked whether it violates the foreign key constraint. If it is, it is rejected, the transaction is rolled back immediately. This is perfectly good for most situations, but here is a situation where I have a table person uh, which has mother and father as attributes, both of which are foreign keys referencing person. Now, the question is how do I insert a person? I have to set the mother and father values for that person. Now, supposing I insert uh, data, I bulk load data of a lot of people in some arbitrary order. So, it is possible that when I insert a particular person, the father and mother of that person have not yet been inserted. So, those ID values, I am storing the ID values in this record, but right now the other records have not been inserted. They are going to happen later in this series of insertions. Now, ideally, the foreign key constraint should be checked at the end of this transaction, not during the transaction. Now, most implementations by default will check it immediately and will roll back. So, what do you do? So, there are several options. One option is to order these inserts, so that you will insert the parents first and only then the children. So, you go in the uh, history order. So, you can be sure that when you insert a person, all ancestors of that person have already been inserted. In particular, the parent and parents have been inserted and therefore, this insertion will not cause a foreign key violation. The father and mother records are already there when you insert a particular person's record. But this requires more work. I may have to sort the relation somehow, which is actually a fair amount of programming work. So, another option is to do two passes. In the first pass, you set father and mother both to null, even though you know what they are, you set them to null for the moment, insert all persons. Then do a second pass going and updating all the records, setting the father and mother appropriately. This is safe because in the first pass, all people have been inserted. In the second part, those IDs will be there in the table, it would not cause a problem. So, that is the second solution, which is actually used quite frequently. In a few cases, the second solution may fail and may require what is called differing of constraint checking. So, in SQL standard, you can tell the database, please do not check the constraint now, hold on. Let me do a bunch of updates. At the end, go back and check the constraints. Now, why is this needed? Here is a case. Um, so, if mother and father is declared as not null, I cannot set it to null. I would have to sort and that may be a lot of work. Now, there is a even more complicated case with cyclic constraints. 
So, here is a case where I have a spouse attribute for person and now not all persons have spouses. Um, so, presumably you cannot declare it to be not null, but supposing I have a table married person. For a person to be married this has to be a spouse. So, it makes sense to declare spouse as not null for married person. Now, what happens? Let us say I have a foreign key constraint, um, I am giving a name to that constraint called spouse ref. It is a foreign key constraint, it says that the spouse attribute references married person. So, we are adding this attribute and this constraint to a table called married person. So, this is a reference to the married person table. Now, we have an interesting situation. I have two people who are married to each other. Supposing I declared spouse to be not null, if I insert the first person, then the spouse reference has to be provided because it cannot be null, but that person has not been inserted yet. So, that will fail. On the other hand, if I insert the other one, the same problem will arise because their spouse is the first person who has not been inserted first. So, whichever order I do these two insertions will definitely fail. So, let me repeat this in case you did not get it. I have two people. Uh, let us say Ram and Sita married to each other and there is an ID for Ram and ID for Sita and I am loading both of them into the database. When I load Ram, the spouse which, uh, attribute which is an ID, is an ID which has not yet been inserted in the database. So, the insertion of Ram will fail if I do it first. If I insert Sita first, then similarly the ID of Ram is not yet there, it will fail. So, the previous solution was to set both IDs to null, but the constraint says not null. So, the only solution here is to tell the system, please defer checking the integrity constraints till the end of the transaction. So, then I will insert both Ram and Sita, constraints are not checked yet. When I commit, it will check all the constraints and at that point, everything is fine. Okay. So, these are the uh, features which SQL supports. Again, it varies by database, not all databases may support all of this. Um, this, uh, this is the last one I will cover before our break, uh, which is the check clauses in SQL can potentially be more complex. I showed you a simple check clause. The syntax of SQL allows you to write anything in a check clause, but most databases will say sorry your check clause is too complicated. I cannot implement it efficiently. In particular, um, here is an example. If you have the schema diagram with you, you will observe that each course section has a time slot associated with it. So, this course runs in time slot 1, time slot 2 and so forth. Now, in the time slot table, time slot is not a primary key because we may have multiple rows, one of which says time slot 1 runs at 8.30 on Monday time slot 2 runs at 9.30 on Tuesday. So, in that table, time slot is not a primary key. As a result, I cannot declare time slot to be a foreign key referencing time slot table. So, now what do I do? How do I make sure that the time slot information in section is correct? I cannot create a foreign key. So, here is an attempt I make. I say check time slot ID is in, select time slot ID from time slot. If this is supported by a database system, if it can check this uh, when it inserts a new tuple or updates a time slot ID, I can make sure that it is a valid time slot ID it does exist. Unfortunately, most database systems do not support this. In fact, no database support system that I am aware of supports this such complex conditions in a check clause. The check clause conditions today can only be very simple conditions, which just refer to the local attributes. It cannot have a sub query in particular. So, this is ruled out. There is another feature called assertions, which is part of the SQL standard, which nobody supports. So, that wraps up the constraints at this point. Let me take just a question or two. Uh, Let us uh, see if anybody has any questions coming up right now. I see a question from Amrita Kollam. Let me select you. Oops. Amrita Kollam, I can see you. Please go ahead and ask if you have a question. 
So the question was about uh, the materialized view, and it was uh, already answered. And the other question which we have is, uh, can we index the entries in uh, index? So what index? The the view has the values. The uh, it has certain attributes, right? So can we index those uh, attributes? That's a good question. Can you index a view? Now the answer to that is. Um, if you have a view which is materialized, so the tuples are actually stored, yes, certainly you can build an index on a materialized view. And uh, most databases which support materialized views allow you to have indices on materialized views. But supposing the view is not materialized, does it make sense to create an index on something which is not actually stored? And the answer uh, which pretty much any database system today says is no, you can't do it. SQL Server says that if you try to index a regular view, I will automatically treat it as a materialized view. So their answer is slightly different. A third possible answer is to say, let me see if I can support it by creating an index on the underlying relation. Uh, as far as I know, no database supports that today. So what you would have to do is find out what are the underlying relations and you go create the indices directly. It is not going to do a translation of an index creation to underlying relations. I hope that answered your question. And let us move to uh, Jaipur Engineering College. They have a question. Jaipur, please go ahead. Uh, suppose uh, uh, we, when we create two views, then uh, we can apply the join operation on both the views at a time. Over to you, sir. Okay. So, as I understood the question, it says if I have two views, can I write a query which joins those views? And the answer is yes. You can do anything with those views just like a regular relation in terms of querying it. In terms of updating it, there are some restrictions, but for queries, it is just like any other relation. You can join, you can aggregate, you can put it inside a nested subquery. You can do anything at all with it. It does not matter. It will work. Okay. Last question from uh, PSG College Coimbatore. PSG. You have been selected. Please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, in the commit transactions, uh, if we commit five times or six times, where that times value stored? Is it in a separate application table or inside the engine? Uh, I am not sure I understood your question. If you commit a transaction, the, where is the commit time stored? Is that the question? Yeah, commit. How many times we committed already to roll back in the correct point? Okay. So the question is, uh, if you have committed, uh, can you commit a transaction multiple times? The answer is no. When you commit a transaction, that's it. It's committed. Okay. Uh, it's like when you get married, you are married. Uh, there is uh, no divorce. Uh, so that's it. Um, now a few databases uh, allow you to define what are called save points and then say that I can roll back to a save point. But that does not mean anything is actually committed. That is just some point. So, it is still uncommitted. It lets you roll back to some intermediate point instead of rolling back all the way to the beginning. So, save points are really uh, markers which allow you to do partial rollback. But once you commit, you cannot roll back anymore. Now, you can have a compensation in the sense that you can have a new transaction which can do undo the effects of the first one. So, supposing you committed um, in marriage, you can have an undo which is a divorce. Uh, similarly, if you commit to uh, removing funds from an uh, account and it is committed, at this point if somebody viewed your account balance, they will see that money has been debited. But you can undo it subsequently by going and crediting money back in. So, once committed, you can only run a fresh transaction to compensate for what happened earlier. You cannot anymore roll back that transaction which was committed. I hope that answered your question. Back to you. Yeah, thank you, sir. So, uh, coming back to the last SQL session, I am going to wrap up chapter 4 with a few uh, miscellaneous topics. I am going to go a little bit fast on this. Uh, the first topic is a few more types in SQL. These include the date, time, timestamp and interval types. Uh, note that SQL does not have a specific type for year or 
for uh, day or so on, uh, but we do have date and time. However, uh, again uh, many databases do their own thing. In particular, Oracle does not have a time uh, type, it has only a timestamp. So, what is the difference between these? A date is just a date, a time is the time of the day, uh, you know 9 o'clock without specifying which date. A timestamp combines date and time and it actually has a controllable precision. An interval is a period of time. For example, your fixed deposit may start on a particular date and its uh, validity period may be let us say 1 year. So, now you if you take the starting date and add 1 year, you get the ending date. Now, is adding 1 year the same as adding 365 days? The answer is not quite because of leap year and so on, but most business tasks for example, ignore these uh, issue of varying dates and they say this is for one year and therefore, it will be on the same date next year regardless of whether it is a leap year or not. So, interval one year has a meaning which is different from interval 365 days. If you do interval 365 days, it will be exactly 365 days afterwards. So, that is those are the basic uh, date and time related types. Um, in our uh, book schema in fact, the fact that Oracle does not have a type called time has an impact on our schema. We wanted a schema that would work on all databases. So, we ended up with two schemas actually. In the book, we use a start time and end time for uh, the time slots. That is the simpler uh, type, the time type, which is part of the SQL standard. However, if you see the actual um, data in the sample data which we have provided, since Oracle does not have a time type, we actually broke up time into start hour and start minute, both of which are integers uh, with constraints on them. And start hour is an integer between uh, 0 and 23, while start time is an integer between 0 and 59, it is minutes. So, uh, that is how we worked around the oracle limitation. Uh, so, you should note this, if you ever uh, deal with the time slot relation, note that the book and the schema which you we have loaded differ in this subtle way. Okay. So, to uh, uh, get things rolling again in terms of the quiz, uh, please press the ST button now to be prepared for the quiz and here is the quiz question. Do not answer the quiz yet till we tell you. So, uh, the interval type basically is a period of time. So, the question is this following expression date 2010 12 14, which is uh, 14th day of the 12th month December of 2010 plus and we are subtracting two different dates there. Um, what would it return? Okay. So, if you want to answer this question, you can read the bullets about the interval uh, type which is listed just above and then read this and answer the question about that particular expression. Is it valid and returns a date? Valid returns an interval? Is invalid or none of the above? So, the bullets above tell you what happens when you subtract a date from another date and what happens when you add intervals. So, let us uh, now start the question. Okay, the timer has started, please check that the red LEDs on your uh, clicker are lit up and then choose one of the answers A through D. You have a minute to answer it or rather 45 seconds as of now. Okay, time is up, let us see what people have chosen. Just give it a few seconds, but while we wait to see what people have chosen, let us see what is the correct answer. Now, as the bullets above say, if you subtract a date or time or time some value from another, what you get is an interval. So, the difference between two dates is an interval. So, if you see that expression, the subtraction there gives an interval. Now, that is added on to a date. So, if you add an interval and a date, that is legal, you get a new date. So, the first option 1 is the correct one, it is valid and returns a date. Um, 
it does not return an interval. So, 2 is not a correct answer, 3 is also wrong because it is valid as is 4. So, now let us look at the um, bar chart. This time uh, quite a few have managed to connect through, just uh, 3 or 4 remote centers have not made it this time. But very, very few responses have come. Uh, maybe I did not give you enough time to read the question or what. So, I purposely did not uh, you know read the whole uh, question you know slide out to you. I gave a question which required you to read the slide and I thought I had given enough time for you to read it. Maybe I did not uh, because clearly uh, people have been confused and have randomly chosen one of A through C more or less. As I said uh, expressions which subtract a date from another date given interval, you add an interval to a date, you get a date. So, the query is perfectly valid. Okay. So, now moving on, the next one is on creating indices. Now, what is an index? We are going to see this in a lot of detail in a little bit uh, a few days from now, but an index is basically a structure which lets us find tuples which we are looking for very quickly without going through every single record. So, uh, for example, um, I have a student relation. If I want to find a student with a given identifier, one way is to go through every record of that relation sequentially till I find the correct student I am looking for. That can obviously be very slow if you have a lot of students. So, is there a way to find the relevant student very quickly? And indeed, there are data structures uh, based on trees, a uh, data structure called uh, B plus tree is very widely used for this, which can find the student uh, record given the ID very quickly. What do I mean by very quickly? Um, we will see this later, but typically with a few disk accesses in a maybe 20, 30 milliseconds worst case, uh, we can find a student with a given ID. Whereas, scanning a whole student relation may take seconds or minutes on a really large system. So, SQL uh, as a language did not address how to create indices, although indices are very important. If uh, students log on to the system and you need to display their name given their ID, that is a lookup and if it happens frequently, you need an index on student ID. So, how do you create this? Most database systems support a syntax which looks like this. I can say create index, give a name for that index on relation name and then in parenthesis the attributes on which I want to create an index. In this case, create index student ID index on student ID. So, that index is created. I can create an index on multiple attributes, which are treated as concatenated together to form a single key. We will see this in more detail later on. So, now if I give a query, select star from student where ID equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, I am not saying use the index or I am not saying do not use the index. I am not saying anything. It is the job of the database system to figure out that, hey, there is an index on ID and therefore, maybe I should use that index to answer this query. And that is the job of the query processing system and every database has a fairly intelligent system which will do this. It will use the index if it is available. So, we will see more on this later. But this is can be viewed as part of the data definition language of SQL, the create index construct. Okay. The next topic is a new type called large object types. Now, in uh, pretty much every implementation of SQL, there is a limit on how big a single record can be. A single record is usually limited to maybe 16 kilobytes, 32 kilobytes. 64 kilobytes, there is some limit typically. And there is a reason for this limit to do with uh, the implementation of uh, recovery and atomicity and various other things, which is greatly simplified if you do not have very large records. And most records are small. If you allow one or two records to grow very large without knowing about it, it complicates life a lot for the database. So, pretty much every database puts limits on the size of fields in a record, total record size and the size of individual record fields. So, if I want a string which is stored in a tuple, maybe that string can be 2 kilobytes, 8 kilobytes, 16 kilobytes, 
some limit is there, some small limit. If I want to store a very large string in there, I cannot. But obviously, many applications need to store large strings in there, you know, maybe a whole web page, maybe an uh, entire uh, book or maybe an image, a photograph, which can be quite large. So, how do you store all the such things in a database? And the answer is to create a new type called a large object type. In fact, there are several large object types, uh, two of which are widely used. There is the character large object or C lob and there is the binary large object or B lob or blob or clob. So, there are these two types which are widely used and if you want to store anything very big more than a few kilobytes in length, you should be having uh, attributes using one of these types. Now, there is another problem with large objects. If I run an SQL query and say uh, select uh, image from some table and then the thing tries to print an image on my screen in ASCII form, I am in trouble. So, usually what happens is um, you, you would have a application which fetches the image and then displays it. Now, if the image is you know 10 megabytes, this is not a problem, but say we have a movie which is 2 gigabytes and now it is fetched onto your computer and maybe your computer has uh, you know just 2 gigabytes of memory and it is going to fill all memory. So, usually what happens is these large objects cannot be directly fetched using an SQL query. Instead, an SQL query will give you a kind of a handle, a file pointer of some sort, which will then allow you from the API to fetch bytes from that large object or conversely to store bytes into that large object. So, essentially the database ends up treating these large objects as separate files, much as your file system stores files these are in effect separate files in the database system and the interface to it consists of reading byte after byte of the file or writing byte after byte into a file. Uh, the specifics depend upon the API, I will skip that here. The last uh, topic for chapter 4 is authorization on relations. Now, a database can have multiple users and if you create one account per student, you probably do not want a student to go and see the data of another student. And by default, um, you know, the uh, contents of a particular student's uh, data are not visible to anybody else. But then, two students may collaborate on a project or you as a teacher may want to give a table which is available to all students. How do you do that? The way to do that is to grant privileges to specific users and then there is one more concept called a role which I will come to in a bit. So, the grant statement grants privileges on some objects typically relations or views to a list of users or roles which is a concept we will see in a little bit. Okay. So, that is the uh, basic structure. A user list can be an actual user ID or a role as I said. It can also be public which means granted to everybody. You may find this useful if you create a table and want it available to all students of your course, you say grant uh, privilege which is select privilege on this table to public. I will come back to this slide in a moment after seeing some examples. So, here is an example which says grant select on instructor to u1, u2, u3. So, those three users alone have access to instructor, uh, select access to instructor, meaning they can read from the table, they cannot write to it unless that privilege is granted. Now, who grants the privileges? The privileges are normally granted by whoever owns that particular table. If you created the table, you own it. So, you would then be able to give authorization. The database administrator role can also grant authorization for any table created by anybody else. Another uh, privilege is the ability to insert a tuple into a table. So, you may want to grant someone select, but not insert. You may want to grant someone select and insert, but not update, meaning they can keep adding new records, but if you allow people to go back and modify old records, maybe they can do shady stuff they can go and cook the account books afterwards. 
So, maybe you will give an insert privilege, but you will not give an update or delete privilege. So, they can only keep adding records. This is a common business need. Or you may give the ability to update an existing record, delete records or all privileges, which means do anything to that relation. Typically, it is relation, it could be a view also. So, now coming back, if I grant a privilege on a view, if I grant select on a view, that does not imply I am giving any privileges on the underlying relation. Why is this important? Think back to the faculty view, which hit the salary attribute. The idea was uh, staff should be able to see a department name, address, whatever of instructors, but not their salary. So, that view, if I give grant select on that view to somebody, the view is defined in terms of instructor, but that person does not have select on instructor. They only have select on the view, not on the underlying table. Now, once you have granted authorization, there may be a need to revoke it. If that person uh, moves to a different department, the person leaves the company, whatever, you may wish to revoke it. So, the revoke command uh, says revoke whatever privileges you want to revoke on relation of view name from whichever users you want to revoke it from. The revoke key list could be public, which means public loses privileges. Now, what is interesting is the following situation. Let us say I explicitly grant select on a table to a particular user u, then I also grant select on the table to public, then I revoke grant uh, select on the table from public. So, first I gave it to u 1, then I gave it to public which is everybody, then I revoked it from public. So, what should the system do? This person is also u 1 is also member of public, should it be completely revoked from u 1? The answer is no. What happens is a revoke, revokes a grant which was made earlier. So, it is revoked from public, but the other grant made to u 1 is still there, it is not gone away. So, when I revoke from public, u 1 can still see it, because there was a grant to u 1 which is still there. If I revoke that also, then u 1 can no longer view the contents of a, that relation. Uh, when in the revoke, you can explicitly list privileges, select, insert, delete or all to revoke all privileges that were granted already. There is another kind of privilege called the references privilege. Now, this privilege is required to create a foreign key referencing somebody. So, let us say that a grant reference department name on department to a user called Mariano. This allows Mariano to create a table which has a foreign key reference to department. If I do not grant this privilege and I have not granted all privileges, Mariano cannot create a foreign key referencing department. Why? Because if Mariano creates a foreign key referencing department and creates a tuple with a particular value, say computer science, I can no longer delete the computer science department at will. So, what I have allowed is Mariano to do something which prevents me from deleting a tuple. Now, if Mariano gets this access by default, he can cause me trouble. Therefore, by default he will not get it unless you explicitly grant the references privilege or you say grant all privileges that includes the references privilege. So, that is the reference authorization. And finally, um, you can grant an authorization with somebody with the permission to grant it further to some others. So, when I say grant select on department to Amit with grant option, that means in turn Amit can grant that further to somebody else, perhaps with grant option again. So, you can have a hierarchy of administrators, the top guy grants it to somebody, this lower guy can grant it to other people as required. And then I can revoke um, select from Amit um, cascade, which means that whoever Amit has granted it to will also have the privilege revoked. On the other hand, if I say revoke select on department from Amit restrict, what it means is if Amit has granted it to somebody, then I the revoke will fail. Anyway, there are a lot more details. I am not going to go into 
all the details. Uh, I am going to stop here with respect to the authorization features. Uh, maybe I will take a few minutes for questions from chapter 4. So, if anybody has questions, please uh, indicate it on a view. So, um, so the first question says, uh, where is the commit point stored? For example, say after 5000 records stored. Uh, this is actually a function of what you define as a transaction. Uh, there are performance issues in uh, supposing you want to load a lot of data. If I want to roll, load a million records, if I try to load all of them as a single transaction, many databases will run into trouble saying that the transaction is way too big. So, what they will do is uh, they will force you to break it up into smaller pieces. Now, on the opposite end, a user may say every record which I want to insert is a separate transaction. I will insert this record, commit, insert, commit that will be very slow on many database systems. So, what people do in practice is they uh, insert some number of records, let us say 1000, 5000, whatever. The programmer chooses this. After doing 5000 inserts, they commit, start a new transaction, insert 5000 more, commit and so on. This is under the programmer control. Now, what is the optimum value? It, that depends on the database system, but a rule of the thumb is uh, maybe a 1000 records is not a bad choice on many database systems, because uh, it is to do with how big the records are, how big the page is, uh, but a thousand is a rule of the thumb. Okay. The next question is, uh, can we create a view for a role? Um, so, this question was an anticipation of uh, roles, which I did not actually cover much in this slide, um, but since that question has been asked, let me say a little bit about roles. So, I can create a role in just like I create a user. So, example I can create a role called instructor, I can create a role called student. These are widely used. If you have uh, started using the Moodle system as I hope all of you have, you would have seen that people have roles as a student or a teacher or a teaching assistant as a uh, you know uh, center coordinator or whatever else. There are many roles. So, the idea is that you can create a role you can grant privileges to a role just like you grant it to a user. So, the role teacher can have certain privileges, the role student can have certain privileges. Now, when I create a new student, I can grant the student privilege, the student role to the particular user. So, I have broken it up into two parts, grant privileges to role, grant role to user. This is actually a much more sensible way of granting permissions than to grant each permission individually to each user. That is not required. All the students have basically similar privileges. There are some differences, like a student can see their grades and not other people's grades, uh, which is called fine grained authorization. Unfortunately, SQL does not support this kind of thing, although uh, any application which you build implements it in application logic. So, coming back, it makes sense to have roles, grant privileges to roles and grant roles to user. So, the question was can we create a view for a role? When you create a view, the view is created by a user or if you uh, there is a way to say uh, you know treat it as be belonging to a role rather than belonging to a user. Now, you can grant access to that view to other roles and grant the role to user. So, that gives you whatever flexibility you need. Okay, so, I hope that answered that question. Uh, the next question is any guidelines for defining views considering performance and security views. Uh, there is no um, you know clean set of guidelines. Uh, so, in particular for performance views, uh, it is actually a fairly difficult task for a human to choose which views to create to support a set of uh, queries in an application. Uh, unless you understand what the optimizer is doing. Now, a uh, good uh, system administrator who understands query optimization can do this, but most people will find it difficult. So, what many databases today support are uh, what are called wizards or assistants or whatever, which will let you uh, you know monitor the database system for some time and see what queries are being executed and then suggest that the system will suggest maybe you should create these three materialized views 
and these 10 indices which will help you run these queries faster. So, that is uh, widely supported in commercial databases, uh, Oracle, DB2, SQL Server all support it. Uh, PostgreSQL as far as I know does not support it. All, there may be some uh, tools which some people have developed, but it is not part of the database system as of now. Okay, the next question is what is the difference between a recursive relation and a self join? A recursive relation is the view which is defined in terms of itself. If you have done a recursive program in C or Java, you know what recursion is, it is the same thing. A self join is a much more uh, simple concept. A self join is simply joining a relation with itself, with a copy of, think of it as making a copy and then joining it. So, that is not the same as recursion. Uh, the next question is, can we have a foreign key referencing to some unique column? And the answer is yes. In uh, SQL, uh, you are allowed to have a foreign key references a relation and list the columns which it references. This is ok as long as the referenced columns are declared as unique. If they are not declared as unique, you cannot do this. Uh, the next question is, um, in attribute defined as unique, I have observed that we can have only one null values in SQL Server 2000. Um, so, maybe there is some implementation uh, defined restriction there. Um, so, this business of is null equal to null? As we discussed, null should not be equal to null because we do not know what the value is. So, for a column declared as unique, as per the SQL standard, you should be able to have multiple uh, rows with null value. But some databases may not quite follow the standard and it appears you have found this happening in SQL Server. But there is another issue, if you group by and a particular uh, set of rows all have null for the group by column, what do you do? Are you going to create one group per null value? SQL itself is inconsistent. I think the standard says that all the null values will be put in one group and you get a aggregate for the null group. So, grouping is kind of uh, special in the SQL standard. Okay. Um, the next question is, can we rename the attribute of a view while creating a view? And the answer is yes, you can certainly rename. Uh, we had some examples of this in the with clause and you can do the same thing with views. Uh, Here is another interesting question. If you have two different databases, can we use the primary key of one relation in database 1? as a foreign key for another relation in database 2. Uh, that is an interesting question and the answer is generally no. Uh, so, the question is what is a database? The idea is databases are independent of each other generally. So, you should be able to bring up one database while another database is shut down. In such a situation, creating a foreign key uh, or reference from one database to another cannot really be enforced. If the reference database is down, how do you even check or vice versa? If you are deleting, how do you know if anyone is referencing you? So, in general this is not allowed. However, some databases allow you to define views in terms of another database. Oracle allows this. So, that view will basically run if the other database is up. If that database is down, tough luck, that view will fail. So, as long as both are up, the view will run. But note that an integrity constraint is something more uh, serious and you cannot uh, generally allow such references to other databases. Is there any kind of file pointer for large objects? As I mentioned, uh, the SQL uh, standard requires support for something called a large object locator, an object locator, which is just like a file pointer. Now, the specific way in which it is implemented depends on the API you are using to talk to the database. Our next topic is actually JDBC. So, JDBC has a specific way of accessing large objects. I am not going to cover it in the talk today, but if you are interested, you can go look it up. It is not very hard. It is much like reading a file or writing to a file. The one more question is, how can we store an image in a database? Uh, the blob type, blob type is generally used for storing images. Um, I should note that uh, many systems find that if, if you have really large collections of images and you put it inside of the database, uh, then certain procedures like backing up the database and so on become very slow. So, 
there are many database systems which will let you store objects like this external to the database, but they will also control that part of the file system where you store the object and um, make sure that that object will not get deleted arbitrarily. So, they actually divide up the space into regular database and then a file system storage for large objects. Um, so, DB2 uh, for example, supports this feature. So, uh, you may choose to use that to store large objects or you may choose to use regular blobs in the database to store images. It depends on how big the images are. So, for our ID card database in IIT, our images are not very big. Maybe, uh, you know, they are uh, um, 10 kilobytes or 20 kilobytes. It is a fairly small image and we can certainly store this for thousands of users without any problem in the database. And with that, uh, we have wrapped up chapter 4.